Welcome everyone. I appreciate everyone's attendance this afternoon. It's, this is a, a big, big day for, for not only the Diversion Board of Authority, but for our communities and, and our counties in, in the metro area here. So um, today we're very, very pleased to have um, Senator Hoven, Governor Burgum, and Colonel Calkins with us. And uh, I'll just start it off right away and, and turn it over to Senator Hoven. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman. And I'll turn to the mayor since we're in your community for any uh, kind of opening remarks you want to make, and then I can make some. And turn well, we're very excited all the people that have assembled here today and here in our new chambers. So we tried to do as well as the county has done, and we've built the chambers here that we can have great meetings at. Um, the mics are better, and as I told Mary, we look better on TV, Senator, so we've arranged this so you look really good for Washington. <laughs> but uh, we're really glad to have you here. Uh, unfortunately, just as you arrived, or just before you arrived, uh, we had to do an emergency declaration in uh, Fargo, Moorhead, and Cass County because we are going to force a flood this year. And we know that when you were governor, you helped us out very much in 209 and helped us save the city. So we very much appreciate that. And we're very happy to have Governor Burgum here because he also saved many things in his life uh, during that 209 flood in Farmstead as well as the, the city. And uh, he will also get a yellow vest as time goes on when we actually have him do a sandbag. But <laughs> welcome aboard. Thanks, Mayor. And, and to our other mayors that are here, and. Uh, I uh, want to welcome you as well, Mayor Judd, and of course, Mayor Dardis. Any opening thoughts uh, from our other mayors before we get rolling here, guys? Well, just express uh, <clears throat> on behalf of the uh, City of Moorhead Council our deepest gratitude and thank you uh, for both of you uh, and your teams for getting us to this point. Greatly appreciate it. Senator, it's wonderful to hear from you. Welcome. Great to have you with us also today. I think it's appropriate that as we meet today, uh, it's on the heels of what you had to do yesterday with your emergency and, and the county had to do with theirs. So uh, let's get this deal done and so we don't have to continue to meet like this every couple of years when right fighting the flood. So thank you for all your efforts, Senator, very much. Thanks, Bernie. Uh, and to our uh, county commission, uh, county commissioners that are here uh, and to our city council members that are here, thank you. Uh, know how much work that uh, you've put into this uh, and, and everyone else that has had a hand in uh, all the hard work that has been done and obviously needs to continue to go on uh, as you look to uh, get permanent flood protection in place so that you're not confronted with the kind of situation you are this year. And I saw, uh, you know, from yesterday's newspaper, you're already out there uh, working uh, to protect the, uh, the whole area uh, this year. Uh, with what a million sandbags um, already and and who knows what else you may have to do right which just again reinforces the need for this permanent flood protection it's not a question of if we're going to flood it, it's when and, and how much right um, so the leadership and and i would say the other thing is the creativity the leadership and the creativity that you've shown uh, in the fargo moorhead uh, red river valley region here it is really a, a national model. I've said that before, but it's absolutely the case. And we see that in a lot of ways. Um, and certainly the governor's leadership on uh, Route B, so incredibly important. Uh, but this is now a $2.8 billion multi-state project uh, for permanent uh, flood protection that's creating a lot of firsts that I think will be followed uh, nationally. Uh, so, as, you know, we're here today to sign the uh, uh, plan partnership agreement, and I want to thank Colonel Calkins, who's been outstanding and his crew has been outstanding. Thank you for your leadership and understanding that it's about getting something done. It's not just about going through all this work. It's about getting something done. You understand that, and we appreciate it, uh, as evidenced by this PPA here today. But it, today, it, it, there's a couple milestones. One is the PPA. Uh, which will sign, uh, Mary and, and of course the Colonel will sign on behalf of the Diversion Authority and the Corp. Huge step, because that's a commitment by the federal government for $750 million to this project. So that's a huge step. But then also, uh, we were able to pass legislation that directed OMB to include new creative projects or financing P3s, if you will, uh, in the budget. 
And so this is the first time we've seen a presidential budget where it's come out and said, okay, we have this new account for P3s uh, and $150 million for those types of projects. That's the type of project we are. That's incredibly important because it means we can get funding out of the budget as well out of, as out of the CORE's project account. The $100 million that we've secured to date is through uh, the project, the CORE's project account. And so we've appropriated money into that project account and then the, the, the CORE has brought it out and we've used it. Um, the key is that we can get it both directly from the budget process as well as from the, from the project account. Uh, because the idea now is that we want to build this in six to eight years, and so we have to have that funding. The other thing the legislation we passed um, for 2019 uh, accomplished is it directed that the Corps of Engineers, um, this time not our St. Paul guys, but uh, the, the folks in D.C., stand up their WIFIA program, their loan guarantee program. So I included language that both said Corps of Engineers you put WIFIA in place, and here's $6 million for you to put that program in place, so don't come back and tell me you can't do it because you don't have the money to do it. There's $6 million. There's the directive. So they're now under uh, legislative directive to stand up their uh, WIFIA program. EPA has a WIFIA program. Now the core will have one, um, and they have the $6 million that, to do it, so we're hoping over the course of this year and or next, they get that program stood up. Why is that important? Well, again, we want to build this project in six to eight years. That means for the federal share, that's why the $750 million was important and why we, get fun, we can get funding both through the budget and through the project core project account. Obviously, you're working at the state level. Gov's here to talk all about that, which is great. But for the local cost share, that funding comes over, what is it, 30-year period of time? Yep. But we're building this in six to eight, so you're going to have to bond for that. Well, the way we reduce your bond cost and hold down your interest cost is with that federal loan guarantee through the WIFIA program. And so that's why that WIFIA piece is so important as well, is because it reduces the local cost uh, for the local sponsors so that, that your uh, tax revenue is able to fund uh, the, the local share. So that's the other really important piece. It's taken us four different pieces of legislation to accomplish this the first was actually getting the project authorized back in 2014 with the Water Resource Development Act. Then uh, in 2016, we came back through energy and water appropriations. We put language in there that actually allowed the project to start. Uh, and then in uh, 18, after your negotiations, we had to go in and change the law so we could go through the federal easements for Route B. And the energy and water bill that we passed this past year is the one that directed the Corps then to set up funding for P3s, as well as uh, to uh, put the, uh, the WIFIA plan in place. And that really paved the way for uh, RD, um, James. And, and big thank you to Assistant Secretary of the Army, RD James. So next time you're in DC, guys, um, I mean, send them some love letters now, but next time you're there, and I see him a lot. And he's been a friend of ours for a long time. He, he was on the uh, Mississippi River, uh, uh, Basin Commission uh, a long time ago, back when we were having real issues on the Missouri River, in that case not getting enough water. He helped us then. He, he knows North Dakota. He's been a real champion and a real friend to all of us, so make sure you all reach out and thank well, We've never seen the Corps move so fast. I mean, that's the fastest they've moved, and we really appreciate that. And uh, uh, Tony Grinberg had come up with the idea, and he was just, I said, you know, the Corps moves a little slow, but it moved faster than 30 days, which was really fantastic. The secondary thing that helped with me is uh, Commissioner Pipcorn owes me another stake because we've increased the federal involvement. So thank you, Dave. I really appreciate that. Um, well, Dave and I talked early on, and he said, well, if you don't get more money for he said, you need to get more money for this project. So, Dave, we did. And, it, <laughs> <laughs> and when a guy that size tells you you need to do something, it, it's motivating. You wish he was a running back instead of an offensive lineman. So. Uh, but anyway, big thanks to Artie James, so as y'all, and I, I know y'all went and saw him last time you were there. Great way to go. Um, make sure you thank him. Um, we appreciate him big time. And uh, another guy we appreciate, Governor Burgum, and we'll turn to you at this point. Thanks, Senator Hoven. Uh, let me just start out with some gratitude. This is, as Senator Hoven said, this is a unique project and a national model, but part of it is uh, unique because of the uh, communities that are involved. We've got two counties, two cities. Uh, 
the commissions for both those cities, the private citizens, the business community, everybody coming together. Uh, you know, the uniquely flat topography of uh, our area uh, puts us all on the same team. Whether you're a student or a homeowner or a parent, uh, we've all been through fighting these incredible flood fights. And I think anybody that's lived here and has been through them understands the, uh, we've seen people lose their homes. Uh, we've, uh, you know, understand the, the cost that it can be. And, and, but everybody's been coming together and fighting for all these years together to try to get this thing done. And today's a big day. It's a day of celebration. And we do have a lot of people to, in addition to the people at this table and the citizens that voted for the, uh, to support the funding mechanisms, the sales tax, but there's people here too. So in addition to the uh, <clears throat> Assistant Secretary James, who Senator Hoven mentioned, uh, who's you know been uh, very helpful, and Colonel Calkins and Terry and everybody that's been working on this for so many years, uh, we're deeply grateful for all that. But I do know that uh, we're very fortunate to have in the U.S. Senate uh, uh, a senator who was formerly a governor who understands and saw firsthand all the flooding, but as you saw, he just walked through the four different pieces of legislation that took, and some of you may have got lost in there, but it's good news we've got a former banker, former uh, head of bank in North Dakota, a guy who understands finance and tax probably as well as anybody in the Senate. We've got plenty of lawyers in D.C. We don't, we don't probably have enough people to understand finance the way Senator Hoban does, uh, and this has been take a complex set of uh, negotiations, and here we are with uh, with uh, Senator Hoven's leadership with another three hundred million dollars of federal money. So I think, on behalf of all of us, I want to say thanks for thanks for that. <laughs> and this is not just a benefit for the Fargo Moorhead community, but this is a this benefits. Uh, you know, Minnesota, it benefits North Dakota, it benefits both states. That's why uh, Governor Dayton and I uh, uh, put so much time and energy into the governor's task force, and we've had great collaboration with Governor Walz since he's taken over and his his team. We want to extend our gratitude to both Governor Dayton and Governor Waltz for their, their collaboration. But when we look at it from the North Dakota side of things, uh, there, you know, there's not a more important piece of infrastructure than this right now. It, it protects uh, uh, nearly one-fifth of the state's population, and within that population, uh, you know, it's 170,000 people plus in the protected area, but within that we've got between college students and K-12 students, uh, close to 50,000 students uh, that are in the protected area. Uh, when we take a look at the property value, $20 billion of property protected, that never, we've never had a flood project ever that's come anywhere close to protecting that uh, amount of value, uh, and, and that number is growing because I mean we've been averaging Fargo, you know Fargo, West Fargo alone. You know if you throw in uh, Moorhead, Clay County, and Cass County, the protected area, but just Fargo and West Fargo alone, the building permits have been averaging over six hundred million dollars a year in terms of growth. And from a state standpoint, uh, there are there are times when uh, the state uh, sales tax collections from Cass County approach twenty percent of the state sales tax. I mean, this is a huge <coughs> revenue source. So in addition to protecting lives and homes and properties, and we can have kids can go to school as opposed to fill sandbags. I know that's a great team building organization. Had a chance to do it with all three of my kids over the years. Uh, but it's uh, it's great that we were able to move forward with, with uh, plan B and get a permit. Uh, and one of the things that's very exciting, uh, Today, in addition to the funding, the other big piece of news today uh, is that the uh, brief that's been filed uh, with Judge Thunheim by the DNR uh, is uh, supportive of us proceeding uh, with. They're basically asking for uh, relief uh, from the injunction so that construction could continue, and that construction could continue uh, on uh, on all aspects and both sides of the, the river, uh, as long as it stays uh, in compliance with the, the 52 uh, components uh, of the permit. And so this is uh, fantastic that through uh, uh, the Minnesota DNR is now uh, with, with this brief, uh, I think you could interpret that, that they're fully supporting Plan B uh, and asking uh, to allow us to get moving ahead with this uh, important project. Uh, and so we're, and I think, you know, as we, you know, I'm sure today we'll also talk about the potential spring threat that we're facing here this year. We don't have to look any further than Nebraska or Iowa or uh, Missouri uh, to realize that uh, uh, even when you think you've got great flood protection, it still can be topped. I mean, we've got levees that are being topped all over the spring that, that I'm sure people thought 
uh, you know, even months ago that they had the appropriate protection in place. And so even though we've made great progress, we still have a lot of exposure. Over 20 miles of temporary levees would have to be built in Fargo. Uh, as we discussed, over a million sandbags. I mean, this is, uh, we, only, only in, in, uh, in uh, Cass and Clay County would we talk about a million sandbags and go, oh, that's, that's, that's nothing, uh, you know, <laughs> because we, what did we do, 14 million one year? So, I mean, so we're making progress, but it's still, uh, it, it, it's still incredibly important project. And from a state standpoint, uh, a n number of you have been in Bismarck uh, continuing to advocate there for additional state funding. Uh, the federal funding uh, that uh, Senator Hoven is spearheaded certainly uh, helps pave the way uh, for additional uh, state funding. And I think as we've noted there that uh, with the additional state funding, this would bring the state share up to 32% state share. That's less than half of, of all the other uh, major flood projects the state's been involved in. So I, people get surprised when I call this a bargain from a state perspective, but it absolutely is in terms of the uh, cost efficiency from a state standpoint. And I think the other thing which we need to remember is, uh, and maybe this uh, spring flood will help us, but I think one of the most dangerous things can happen in flood protection is complacency. You go a few years and pretty soon you think that you don't need uh, uh, you know, catastrophic uh, uh, you know, catastrophic protection, which is what this is really all about. But I think we've got a great history in our state of an amazing outpouring of, of personal support and financial support for communities after they've been devastated. We've done it in Grand Forks in 97. We've done it more recently in Minot. Uh, and, you know, we have an opportunity here as a state uh, to, to do it ahead of time. So we can, we can have a small amount of support before a disaster as opposed to a large amount of outpouring after one. And, and of course, uh, again, what it would do for uh, not just education, but uh, for the medical community where we serve the entire region and the 25 plus, plus thousand people who work in Fargo-Moorhead who live outside the protected area, but their jobs are here. Uh, there is, there is no, nothing more important that we have from infrastructure in our state than completing this project. And today is a big step forward with the, with the funding from Senator Hoven and with the brief that's been filed by the DNR. Uh, we've got a lot of momentum on this project and, and I just say congratulations to all of you in this room who've worked so hard to, to get us to where we are today. So thank you for your leadership and grateful for all you're doing and let's, let's keep this thing rolling. Thanks, Governor, and, and thanks for your ongoing diligent efforts and uh, you know as well as anybody, um, you know, what's going on here and, and how important it is. So thanks for your leadership. I think next we were uh, scheduled for a, a weather service update uh, in regard to uh, this year from uh, Greg Gust. Greg? Thank you, Senator Hoven and Governor Burgum. Mayors, ladies and gentlemen, let's find, first of all, I'm like, I like to see that color green up on these screens, and I'm sure we're all looking forward to that being something we'll be seeing someday soon. So this is again just a quick overview of some of these spring flood outlook situations and any pending storms that might be coming at us here in the near, near term. I do want to point out that, like Colonel Calkin, like the Weather Service here, the Corps of Engineers, we're people that live and work in these communities with you. And uh, I point that out because my colleagues down in the Omaha Weather Service office had to evacuate their offices on the west side of town because of flooding here this past week. And hopefully they'll start returning and patching up what's ever going on there now. But that's something that we deal with along with you all. So this is something that we issued at the end of last week. And again, dealing with the fact that March has been very tough on us, especially this first half of March with these two very wet storms that have come through. Of course, crippling amounts of precipitation uh, just to the south of us here, but still enough into this basin to cause us to go in and reevaluate the, the forecast probabilities. Uh, we're looking at top 10 runoff potential here. So that's, again, a huge amount of water. The landscape throughout this basin is covered in snow in a way that it hasn't seen for a good half dozen, eight, nine, almost years. So back to 2011, when we had this type of extensive snow cover. 
So again, major, major, moderate flooding in many of the tributaries, pushing major, major throughout the main stem of the Red River, and of course all of the tributaries where they butt up to the Red River, we'll see that as well. <laughs> the good news, of course, this week so far has been ideal. If we could keep this type of a melt cycle going for the next couple of weeks, that'd be great. The not so good is uh, things at the end of this week start turning downhill. Next week, we're gonna see a little bit of warm up and then a return into colder and messier. So I'll get into that right now. That's the graphic that we put out last week showing just the target zone of a lot of moderate and major flooding here. And that's greater than 50% risk of that throughout the major, moderate, major flooding throughout this main stem Red River and the tributaries. Um, the ingredients, fall moisture was high, certainly not the level of a 97 or 2009. The stream flow is at normal ranges for now. Obviously, it's going to increase as things melt. But in 97 and 2009, the base stream flow was at very high levels because of all the excessive precipitation carrying over from those preceding wet years. But the frost, fr frost is very deep. Frost is very deep. And that becomes a question on whether or not any of the melting snow, any of the water that's in that snow right now, will have a chance to get into the ground before it's running off and into the rivers. So right now we are approaching extreme in both the snowpack and snow water equivalent. The spring thaw is delayed here now a week or two. And the longer it delays, the increased risk for a fast warm up and for spring rain. So I just want to point out again, we don't have the excess water in the system that we saw in 97 and 09 in 2010 and 2011. And that's because the year before all those years was also very wet, very snowy. So that's one advantage we have this year. That's from the last week. That's moisture in that uh, dark green right at the Fargo area. For those that you could pick it out just above Fargo, actually Halstead area and down through Fargo and pushing south, that's a half an inch or more of total moisture in that rain and snow. And then the yellow areas are two inches or more. Okay, So again, a lot of rain and snow came into the mix, mainly rain over on the Minnesota side, mainly snow on the North Dakota side here. And then of course, further south, just incredible amounts, three inches, four inches of rain down from Sioux Falls area down into Omaha. And you can just catch the news and see what's going on in those areas. So we are not anywhere near the 97 and 2009 amount of runoff levels yet this year. Okay, we're running two, three, four inches above normal in the amount in the system. We have, again, a lot of snow and snow water that is in the pack so far for this year. And if you compare it to a 97 and a 2009 to this time during those floods, you will see that, well, no, back in 97, when they got to, into late March, into April, they were picking up another two, three, four inches of water. Well, we aren't there yet. So we still have to see what's going to happen for the rest of March and into that early April. So there is our ranking. And that, uh, I did not recalculate that from last Friday, but we were seeing here in Grand Forks and in Fargo on the lower right hand, Again, the amounts of water showing up, 8.38 inches of water since October 1st till March 15th here in the Fargo-Moorhead area. And that's more than was in the 96 flood, more than what was in, well, it's just a bit more than just under 2013, just a bit under 2011 to this point in time. And what's coming up? So this weekend, from Saturday night into Sunday, and that's a, a map for Monday morning showing a storm system moving across Nebraska with a cold front that has slid down through us during the day on Sunday and pushed that away. That's the, if that happens, that will be a good thing. It's not going to be good for Omaha. It's not going to be good for Sioux Falls. But if that comes to bear, that will push most of that moisture away from us. Right now, uh, that's what we're looking at through Sunday for precipitation. Just uh, five hundredths to a tenth of an inch coming across the south end of the basin. If you're a model, look at weather models. The GFS has a quarter of an inch to almost a half an inch in the far southern basin. The European, just about nothing. So right now, we're towing the line between those two. But that's for this weekend. Afterward, we'll see a bit of a warm-up bump again. And the and then the end of next week 
is when things start to get messy again. So, so we have to try and melt snow, start moving it toward the river, and this weather today is doing that. <coughs> 8 to 14 days down the road, that's the last week in March. Near normal temperatures expected overall across that week, but again, as I said, next week, the early part of the week a bit warmer, latter part of the week we get colder again. Precipitation-wise, probably could be dry the early part of this coming week and warm, and then getting messy as we get into the next, next weekend. After that, this is a fingers crossed. Are we going to be on that warm and dry side? We hope. But the pattern so far this winter has kept an awfully stormy system, set of systems coming out of that southwest U.S. on us, so stay tuned. And that's the outlook that we have for Fargo. So that shows with that black triangles up there, that are the current conditions we have vetted against each of the last 60, 70 years of flooding, which are those blue dots down there. And if we take these current conditions and vet them against that, that's the risk. So that's what could happen. And so at the tail end, on the far left end, the 90, 95th percentile, that's if we get a perfect thaw. That's the 2014 thaw scenario, where April just sat there and let everything slowly, slowly melt. And the worst on the far end, that's all those other nasty years where that doesn't happen and we get giant snowstorms and rain on top of snow. And we're sitting right there in the middle with a 50% chance of 37.9 feet, okay? The precipitation coming in this weekend, the temperature regime this week, that's all in the normal realm. If we start turning toward above normal precipitation and throw in a faster melt cycle, that pushes toward <laughs> the right-hand side of that graph. So this is another way of looking at it. This is just all those probabilities are smushed. If you can see the lines up there um, on that graphic, the purple line across there is the major flood stage in Fargo. The dashed black line at the top is the flood of record in 09. And then somewhere in that, you'll see a 50% line, and then you'll see 25 and 10. So you see how close we are moving up toward the risk for that flood of record. So we have a better than 10% chance of reaching that flood of record here in Fargo. And then that's just up and down the valley. And over on the eastern North Dakota, or the eastern North Dakota side, I don't have all of these, but again, a lot of flow coming in. Again, up and down the core Red River Valley, major flooding throughout. And then as we get onto the tributaries coming in, I'll just point out Harwood is sitting there. Again, heavily affected by water on the red at that point. So the risk of, of getting near flood of record in Harwood is pretty high. So, Gus, are you a pessimist or an optimist? Just as a curious. <laughs> we actually would like to stay right in the middle of that. And we physically look at this model to see if it's balanced on both ends of ugly and not ugly to make sure that it's tracking along. Uh, one of the things that you can't do with these probabilities as we get later into March is try to run them again because they start to now be affected by the much warmer summertime temperatures and and get wiggly on us. So, so when you predicted two or nine, was Wallacher closer to the final level or were you closer to the final level? Our forecast of 41 feet, which hung on there for a while, was a really good forecast. We had some arm twisting going on in the back that had to say what is the probable worst case condition. And that's where that 43 number, or not, that was the absolute worst case. Yes. And somebody spoke that at a meeting once. And, and we were told we had to put that out to the public. So you were there at the time, and we said, well, this is what we're protecting to, and 43 is if everything else turns bad, and that was big waves on dike and everything else, so. Yep, you're right. But I'm not speaking to the Wallacher question. <laughs> anyway, so again, uh, the last word out of my mouth with other questions you might have is this is something that was put together after that 2010 and 11 and was active in the 2013, 20, uh, 2013 flood, I said 2014 before. Um, and this is a, a possibility for people out there, citizen scientists, anybody out there with a smartphone that can basically take a picture of what's going on and log it into the site and put comments on there from a drop down menu and we can see how the water is where you are. So this is a way for people who are out there watching what's going on to get that information to us. 
Any questions, sir? Any questions for Greg before he wraps up? <coughs> Guess not. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, just one thing, Greg. Uh, yes. the, the community, some of them, uh, Governor Bergen, we went to the schools yesterday and talking about sandbagging, and they asked us if we could show them a YouTube video of how to do sandbagging. So you realize it's been 10 years. So some of the kids don't know automatically how to sandbag. So that tells me that not everybody's used to flood. 20% of our population is new to the community. So one of the questions we get into, uh, probabilistic and then deterministic. Could you just explain to the public when your accuracy becomes increasingly accurate? So at this point, these are probabilities. At some point here in the course of the next, we would think about 10 days down the road, we're gonna start seeing real water start to materialize in these headwaters uh, on the south end of the basin. And as that starts to flow, and we can actually measure what's going on way up in the headwaters, that's when deterministic comes in. That's real water in the system. So now we're forecasting the flow of real water. This is what could happen based on the conditions out there now. Deterministic is when there's water starting to move. So that'll happen hopefully here at the end of March. So to the public, the issue is that he's given it a probabilistic, or it might be, if we make sandbags, we have to be ahead of the deterministic. So just as 209, you say it might go to 43, we had to be prepared to correct right. the city for that level. And as the commissioners would tell you, is when you get out in the sandbagging areas, that takes a certain amount of time. Yep. So you have to have your sandbags ready to the deterministic time. And when it's deterministic, then you can kind of really know what you have to put up there. So that's always the art of a flood fight, is trying to figure out what is really going to be there and what will happen. And the problem we had with 209, that was a 5% chance, the 40.8 yeah. was a 5% chance. So that's why we take it pretty seriously, and we're at 41 for the city right now. So I showed up here in town on a Monday, and by Saturday we were cresting. That's correct. And typically, Fargo, you get on a good flood, the best you'd get to get is seven days. Yep. Heads up. Greg, uh, you, yes, sir. all models depend on data. Uh, do we have better data now than we had in 09 or 11 in terms of either the quality of the data or the number of reporting locations? 97, one of the big things that happened in there was the massive ice storm and power outages that knocked out communications and a lot of, a lot of the communications to those gauges. So we didn't even know for a couple of days afterward what happened. 2009, we didn't have that problem. So again, 2009 had much better communication, much better throughput on that. Today, we've got better modeling, I would say. We also have soil moisture modeling out there. We have soil moisture measuring systems out there, soil temperature, so we can try and find out what that frost is behaving like and work that into the possibility of infiltration. So those are things we did not have in 09, 10, and 11. And of course, citizen science, people out there getting information to us. It's one thing, if you're sitting out there watching ice jamming up against a bridge, I sure would like to know about that because that's very important to what's gonna happen. I'm sure engineers and, and emergency managers around here would like to know that as well. Updating this on Thursday? We won't be updating the numbers. We'll be putting out another update as to what the status of the thaw, how whatever precipitation is, is looking at in the next seven days could affect that. Thanks. Anything else for Greg? Thank you. Thank you. Very impressive. Uh, I turned at this point, uh, Mayor, just uh, local preparations, anything you want to update us on? Uh, two things I'd like to accomplish is, uh, number one, is we did have a brief by the DNR that very much has uh, helped us and be able to perhaps go ahead with construction. And Governor Burgum has been working very vigorously with the Minnesota team, as well as all the Minnesota people on the DA board have been working very hard for us. So, you know, we have secured a bill that's going to push short funding on the Minnesota side, which is really fantastic. And then Governor or Senator Hoven, I'd also just like to thank you because when you look at this list, this is not an easy lift. These are heavy lifts to get to where they're at. And when we went to Washington, the Corps was ready to, to deal with us, to knew what the quest was and what we needed. And oftentimes we do get that, we'll look into this and we'll get back to you. That was the first time I've ever gone to the Corps in which the Corps said, uh, we can have this probably back to you by March 15th. 
and they beat that. They got it in quicker than that. So I want to thank you very much for the ability to do that. And what people need to understand, a project of $2.75 billion is bigger than the Hoover Dam. I mean, this is a huge project in the, in the United States. And we are in the President's budget. There is money for us for next year as well. So it's, it's tucked away in a P3 part that we would do with the Corps, but it, it is somebody that is tucked there that could help us in our next year's budget. So we have a lot of things on the federal level that are right where they're supposed to be. So a lot of people wonder, since 2009, what have you guys done? You've done $438 million worth of work, but what have you got done? Well, I hate to tell everybody, but we continue to grow. So what happens from 210 to 219, or 209 to 219, is our city continues to grow. And when it continues to grow, you have to put more and more protection up. So we are, have at least $100 million worth to do with in-town flood protection, and with the Plan B, we have to have 37, ability to flow 37 through the community. You'll see here where the levees are, where we'll have to add protection. So where you see these uh, red levels is where we need to do more things around the community. And that's where we do sandbagging, HESCOs, clay dikes. We try to minimize sandbaggings, but oftentimes sandbaggings are our first line of defense in, in the neighborhoods. It's not outside in our other areas. And we have to go into some areas and do some of that. Again, diversion done, different fight. But without the diversion, we have to do these things. We've added uh, 17 lift stations, so we're always pumping water out of our storm sewers into the river. During a flood fight, you continue to do that, otherwise you flood within the city. And it's always been, uh, I remember Moorhead one time put garbage trucks on top of the, the sewer tops, or we tried a variety of <laughs> unique ideas, uh, which don't work real well. The pump stations work much better, and that's what everybody has done. We've done uh, over 240 acquisitions. The temporary fight level now is going to be 20 miles of emergency levees and approximately 1 million sandbags. Next slide, Greg. And uh, the, in the, just to go back to 209, and we did 52 miles of protection. We're only doing, uh, we're doing less than that now, 20 miles. And we had levees, we had ESCOs, we had porta dams, and we had 10 miles of sandbags. 7.3 million sandbags were used at that time. At the same time, Moore had to have a hit flood fight as well that had eight miles of levees and nine miles of sandbags. And do I go, that's it? Okay. I had another chart ready and all that does is it shows you which neighborhoods are gonna need sandbags in our estimate. So that gives you an idea which neighborhoods we have to do stuff. And we almost look like that little kid with a couple teeth knocked out. We have a lot of our neighborhoods that we've bought up and done and put in dikes, but there's some uh, homes that either didn't let us buy out or we have not been able to do that, that those are the homes we have to use as primary line of protection. Um, but that's more where you're gonna use your sandbags. And we'll be prepared, uh, we'll continue to meet, and next Monday we're gonna have a public meeting for the public so they'll get an idea of what's coming towards us and what the expectations are. Thank you. Mayor, I, I, that's so important that we recognize how much work has been done here uh, at the local level. I mean, it, it is remarkable. When you talk about 52 miles of protection uh, on the North Dakota side, 17 miles of protection on the Minnesota side. I mean, it, it takes an incredible amount of work uh, to do that. And so it is important that, you know, as we're looking at flooding this year, people realize all the work that has been done. And so uh, thank you for that. And I guess I turn uh, Commissioner Scherling for update uh, from, the, from the DA. Well, thank you. And before I get into uh, the Diversion Authority, I, I'm going to put on my Chair of the Cass County Commission hat and talk about rural Cass County's uh, flood efforts. Um, we're, of course, once again facing an exceptional flood and beyond the threat of serious and potentially record-setting flooding in the, in the Red River, um, Cass County's tributary rivers will also uh, be nearing historic crests. We expect major flooding along the Wild Rice, Cheyenne, Maple, and Rush Rivers. This will be a county-wide flood fight as we expect road and infrastructure damage from northwest of Page to southwest near Enderlin southeast to Davenport and Oxbow, and north to Harwood and Argusville. We expect several hundred road closures, and that is probably one of our biggest concerns, uh, traveling down a township road and coming to, to water and trying to turn around. It's very, very dangerous for our citizens. While the flooding effects will be felt throughout the county, we expect a majority of our effort will be focused along the Red River, both north and south of Fargo and along the Cheyenne River from West Fargo to north of Harwood. Over the last 10 years, the county has taken great strides in flood damage reduction through 175 home buyouts. 
We have also completed infrastructure improvements to provide access to flood prone areas. Through the efforts of Senator Hoven, we were able to secure FEMA funding to build a new bridge to the isolated community of Lakeshore. You may remember that there were 33 homes in this area that were previously cut off for more than 40 days in 2009 with only boat access to bring supplies. This new bridge will allow residents and emergency responders to access the Lakeshore community during a flood. In addition, flood mitigation improvements have been completed in many areas throughout Cass County, including Argusville, Mapleton, Castleton, Normanna Township, Emden, Arthur, Hunter, and the Upper Maple River Dam on a couple of occasions. This work has been accomplished in part through our county flood sales tax. While we have made improvements, we still have many, many needs. At the current 50% flood potential that Greg was just speaking of, we have over 250 homes in risk on the Red and Cheyenne Rivers. At the 25% flood, we have 500 homes at risk. And if it goes up to 5%, we have 800 homes in rural Cass County that are at risk. To this end, we have three key objectives to in our rural flood fight. First, we protect key infrastructure and large rural subdivisions. Second, we provide flood fighting materials and expertise to rural residents. And third, we posture our law enforcement for traffic control and finally rescue operations. While we know the challenges ahead of us are great, the difficulty is in knowing how the flood will play out. Every flood is different and challenging and the various tributaries that Cass County deals with in their rivers. It's been eight years since our last damaging flood and across our many communities, we have many new neighbors. We ask that our residents and especially our new residents prepare for this flood. At Cass County, we have a team of flood experts that are ready to assist flood related questions. You can visit our website and there is a very interesting interactive GIS capability there that you can put your address of your own home in and you can see where the water will get on your property when it will start touching your home and your outbuildings and whatnot. And somebody mentioned building sandbag dikes. Um, NDSU Cass County Extension has got a video on our website that will teach you how to build a proper sandbag dike. <laughs> um, but I understand the Army Corps of Engineers has also volunteered efforts to help um, both Fargo and Cass County in our flood fighting efforts. So um, at any rate, um, over the next week, we expect to start up our sandbag production. This will be separate from um, the city of Fargo sandbag production. Uh, we will also be hosting a series of public meetings to better inform the residents in the rural areas. Our sandbag operations will be held at the Cass County Highway Department. That's next to Bonanzaville, which is near the, the fairgrounds in West Fargo, if that helps any of you know where that is. Um, based on a 38-foot flood on the Red and an 892-foot flood on the Cheyenne, we will require 100,000 filled sandbags. And we, in, in addition, we will need to distribute two to 300,000 empty sandbags. For a 40-foot flood on the Red and an 892-foot on the Cheyenne, we'll need 250,000 filled and distribute more than 400,000 empty sandbags. And we will need volunteer help to get this accomplished. We will be contacting area schools, particularly West Fargo High School, um, Kindred, and Northern and Central Cass in the next few days and hope that we can get some volunteers through those groups. In addition, the Sheriff's Office will begin canvassing residents near the river to assess their situations and make sure that everybody remains safe. So that's what we're up to out in the, out in the county. Well, you're, there's a lot of work to it. Um, there is. It's amazing. Uh, and, and I was asking about these areas then are mitigated under the project. That's correct. Yeah, because I mean, you're talking about a lot of, a lot of work uh, that you have to do. Uh, even in a year here where, you know, we, hopefully we don't know, but uh, we may not hit a new peak, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And our, our goal with this project has always been to protect as, as many people as we possibly could. And those people that we are unable to protect with this project, we will be, you know, offering buyouts and relocations to get them someplace safe for, for future floods. Okay. Uh, anything else that, if not, uh, on the North Coast side, 
otherwise we'll turn to the Minnesota side. Commissioner Campbell for, for an update. Sure, thank you. Um, I'm gonna start with um, uh, some of the ongoing things that we've been doing in Minnesota. Um, and I'm gonna start with the um, funding that we're working with in the state of Minnesota and both Clay County and the city of Moorhead have uh, officially requested $86 million from the state of Minnesota uh, for the um, diversion project. That's broken down into two components, one being $43 million for in-town work within the city of Moorhead and what was formerly um, a portion of my home area of Oakport Township, which, which has now been, is part of the city. Uh, Four million of that has already been secured, so there's a current bill in the Senate right now in the state of Minnesota that is a request for $39 million. That would, um, that would um, basically secure all the remaining in-town work within the city of Moorhead. Um, the, over, the other $43 million um, is to, would deal with issues outside of the city limits of Moorhead. Uh, we did send a letter in to the governor and to the DNR requesting that that $86 million, uh, we understand that that's a hefty amount to get in, in one biennium, so that we've requested that over a three biennium period of time. So, so we'll, we will continue to, to work on that um, with, the, with the state and our local legislatures are, are fully supportive of that request. I, I would like to um, thank you, Senator, for the work that you've done on securing the federal funding that uh, on the Minnesota side, that's important to us too. And so thank you for the work on that. Uh, Governor Burgum, I wanna really give a shout out to you, uh, your work with uh, the state of Minnesota, uh, working together on that task force. I think the results that we got from the Minnesota DNR in their brief to the court uh, I don't think that would have happened without the work of your task force. So thank you for that. And I agree with you that that really, uh, that really sets the stage for some things to really start to happen on this project. I've been, I've been anxious for nine years to see some dirt being dug and I think we're getting close. Uh, and I do want to um, touch a little bit um, on the Buffalo Red um, issue that's, uh, you know, there's, there's been some discussion. We've been working with the Buffalo Red. That's my understanding that they, they went to and had a meeting with the DNR last Friday. And I think they had a, a good meeting there. Um, and, and Commissioner Sherling and I also, over the course of the last few weeks, we went to Becker County and the Ottertail County Commissions, giving them an update on this project and reminding them of the importance of this project to their economic concern, you know, for livelihood as well. And, and we were fortunate to um, get full support from both the Becker County and the Ottertail County Commissions. Uh, uh, when I, part of the importance there is, is both of those counties, along with Clay County and Wilkin County, represent the Buffalo Red Watershed District. And so we've had uh, three of our counties that have have sent a strong message that a contested case is not the way to go and that, that we should be dealing with um, uh, our local permitting issues on, just in that fashion, just addressing it in that way. So, so we continue to work with the Buffalo Red and with the DNR um, to hopefully resolve some of these remaining litigation issues that are out there and, I, and I, I'm more and more encouraged every day as I, as I um, discuss this with these folks. Um, in terms of the uh, spring flood threat uh, in, for, for Minnesota, we had a meeting this morning and we brought in our emergency operations uh, manager. We, are, we haven't issued a state of emergency yet. In all likelihood we will. I, I think we have a tendency to um, follow along with, uh, with uh, Moorhead and, and so, we will kind of follow what Mayor Judd does there, and when that happens, we will. Um, one of the issues uh, within the city, there's there's certainly some areas that are that need shoring up, and I, I'm not the best person to discuss that. But we also have a significant amount of of um, flood issues that 
pertain to the Buffalo River, and which creates an awful lot of overland flooding in Clay County. So uh, on March the 29th, our, our, our Emergency Operations Command Center is gonna open up uh, in a mock activation on the 29th. Uh, the reason we're doing that is we're going to be in a brand new facility, which is our new law enforcement center in Moorhead. So, so they're going to do a mock activation on that, and with the likelihood then, of course, uh, for the real deal to follow shortly after that. So um, I, I can't give you the number. I think the number of sandbags I've heard in Moorhead is around 200,000 sandbags. I, I can't be held to that. And I know in, in rural Clay County, we heard this morning that there will be about the same number available for rural Clay County as well. With that, I, uh, um, I, I think that's what I have for you. Good. Thanks, Commissioner. And I'll, Mayor Judd, anything else on the Moorhead side uh, as far as flood preps that you want to bring up? Well, thank you, Senator, and I'll be brief. And I want to echo the uh, sentiments of uh, Commissioner Campbell. Uh, I'm, the, I'm a newbie, obviously, to all this, and I know for sure that your work, along with Governor Burgum, we're happy and blessed to be at this point right now. So thank you both and your teams for all that you've done uh, in the past and, and currently and in the future to make sure that this project does go through. Uh, <clears throat> with that being said, uh, as far as the City Moorhead update of the City plans to have a press conference later on this week, at that time I will announce a, an emergency declaration for our city uh, at that time. Also, I want to give a shout out <clears throat> to our executive leadership team, headed by City Manager Christina Volkers and her staff. We have been meeting constantly to develop our emergency plan for the uh, city and our residents, and uh, that should come to fruition later this week. Also, <clears throat> a big special shout out to Dr. Robert Zimmerman. Uh, He's our seasoned vet uh, when it comes down to flood fights. And so, you know, he's going to carry us forward. And we're very confident in the plan and his leadership and his experience uh, to protect our city. So, you know, the bottom line is for our residents in our region, uh, our city will be, pre be prepared to uh, handle whatever Mother Nature throws at us. So thank you again. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Bernie, anything else from the West Fargo side? <clears throat> We have not declared an emergency. Um, uh, we've been collaborating, working with Mayor Mahoney and uh, City Manager Bruce Grubb, and I'd extend that to my friend Jonathan Judd, also mayor, uh, that the city of West Fargo, we are protected by the Cheyenne diversion, but that is uh, tenuous sometimes too because of ice jams and uh, not knowing how the thaw is gonna go and all the weather things. So we've been meeting with our team as well of uh, engineering and public works and we've actually uh, initiated some uh, RFQs this, today uh, where we're going to be prepared. And so, uh, you know, we stand next to our friends and our neighbors of, of Moorhead and, and Fargo and certainly Cass County and any other city that uh, if, if in fact West Fargo is protected and uh, any of our resources or our expertise, because we fought lots of floods over the years too in West Fargo, will be available and we'll be there to help you. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, all right, at this point, Colonel Calkins, uh, we're gonna turn to you. Thank you, Senator. Update. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start with, uh, with the, the flood uh, threat this spring, the Corps for the past uh, two weeks has been tracking that threat uh, very closely, uh, not just in the Red River Valley, but the Missouri, uh, sorry, the Minnesota and the, and the Mississippi rivers as well. Um, I declared a flood emergency for our district last Monday. What that allowed us to do is get some federal funds, uh, kind of some seed money to start uh, activating our flood area engineers. Mark Wilmis is our, uh, our point man here in Fargo, and he's already met with uh, the Fargo city engineer. Uh, met with him yesterday, and so we're coordinating closely on uh, what uh, what the city needs and what we can provide, and we're looking forward to continuing uh, the close relationship there that we've had for many years. Um, we're also updating hydraulic modeling, which is very useful as you try to predict where uh, the, the danger areas are going to be. And then finally, we've been drawn down our flood control reservoirs. We've got four of them that influence the Red River Valley, so uh, those are Lake Ashtabula, uh, Hami, Hami Dam, 
uh, Orwell Lake and Lake Traverse. So we're drawing those down to be able to uh, uh, hold as much of the runoff as, as is safely possible. Uh, so we, we will continue uh, working hard and monitoring that closely. Um, some, of the, some of the people in the St. Paul district have, have fought uh, floods you know, hand in hand, side by side with uh, the people of Fargo and Moorhead and uh, Cass and Clay counties uh, several times over the past uh, 10, 20 years. And so we'll have some, uh, some very experienced hands who are, are more than willing to join the fight. Um, for the, the task at hand today, this uh, public, uh, sorry, this, um, the, I've got P3 and PPA mixed up, but the project partnership agreement, um, I'm, I'm going to be signing that today on behalf of the Honorable R.D. James, the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works. So uh, he uh, expresses his regrets at not being able to be here today, but fully supports the project. Uh, General Semonite, the Chief of Engineers, and uh, General Kaiser, the Mississippi Valley Division Commander, uh, also uh, expressed their regret for not being able to be here. They are going to try to make a visit up here in, uh, in mid-April uh, to see what's going on. The mayor asked if we could bring him on April 15th to see the crest of the flood. Uh, I'm not sure if that's <laughs> going to work out, but uh, hopefully, hopefully it'll pass through quietly as uh, Greg was, was hoping for a few minutes ago before then. Um, the, the Corps has done a lot of work. We've been continuing. Uh, uh, of course, the project's been held up. Uh, we did move a little bit of dirt uh, back in 2017, actually quite a bit of dirt, uh, but we've been been hung up uh, for a year or so with the injunction. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we've stopped work. So we've done a lot, uh, of course, in cooperation with uh, the governor's task force, which which really uh, shook things loose. Um, but we're, we're behind uh, Plan B. We've completed a lot of things that we have to do in order to get the federal uh, case straight before we can move forward. So things like an updated cost estimate that has a stamp of approval from the Corps of Engineers, uh, supplemental environmental assessment, which uh, brings us into compliance with all the laws we have to follow, um, an engineering document, documentation report, which is our official uh, check to make sure that the, the project makes sense from an engineering standpoint. Um, and then, of course, this PPA amendment. And I, I will uh, lend my uh, support to the, the theory that this happened uh, at, at lightning speed, and it's, uh, it's a feat that we may never see again. Hopefully we do. Um, but really, really pretty an, an amazing testament to the quality of support we have here in this community and from our uh, state and federal leadership. Uh, I was with some people from a big engineering firm last night who were asking me a little bit about this whole P3 thing and, you know, how, how can we replicate that across uh, other projects in the country? And really, I, my, my uh, strongly held belief is that you really need uh, a non-federal sponsor, is what we call the diversion authority, that is, that is smart, that is hardworking, that is sophisticated, that is passionate and committed to getting the project done. Um, so really, without the leadership of the mayors, the city, uh, commissioners, county commissioners, uh, city council members in uh, in Moorhead, without this, the support of the, the local team here, we would not be able to get this done. So uh, re it really truly is a partnership uh, between the federal government and the local sponsors, and we are proud to be part of it. Um, the, the next target in our sites is April 1st uh, is, uh, is the hearing in St. Paul. Uh, we're going to be asking the federal judge to lift the injunction. And we think we have some uh, pretty strong support from most of the parties involved in that lawsuit. So we're hopeful that, um, you know, about a month from now, we'll be able to get back to work. So we've got our fingers crossed and we're going to be ready uh, to move when we have the permission to do so. Thanks, Colonel. Um, well, let's turn then to Mary as the chairman of the Diversion Authority for uh, all the wrap up that, uh, that you think uh, we need to cover. Well, I think most of it's been covered, but I, I just want to thank everyone uh, th that's here today. If it wasn't for all the hard work of all the board members here, both current and past board members and all the staff uh, that work so hard together with us to get us to every, every major milestone that we've gotten to, and, and today certainly is no exception. Special thanks to Senator Hoven for your hard work on, on getting this additional federal funding. $750 million is, is a, an amazing amount, and, and we couldn't do it without you, and we recognize that, and I thank you very, very much. Thank you, Mary. Very good. Follow a little bit with, with our, our lawsuit. Um, you know, as, as you all know, we've, we've been stopped with an injunction for, for a little while now, and, and at one point the judge told us to, you know, 
sit down and come to some sort of agreement. And that couldn't have been possible without the hard work of Governor Burgum and, and the task force that he and Governor Dayton put together. And, and if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be at this spot either. And I, I think we can all safely say that we're, we're really moving forward. We have um, a permit from the Minnesota DNR that we intend to abide by. Uh, we've filed for uh, local permits that, that are needed, and um, every indication is that we will be able to lift this injunction sooner rather than later and get moving once again on, on this important project. So we're very, very excited and, and very, very grateful for that as well, Governor Burgum. Just add a, a, a couple of other things. Um, in the last couple of weeks, we've sent out letters to landowners and that are potentially affected by this. We have, um, and, and we've also reached out to townships and communities. We'll sit down with those folks and figure out what's the best path forward um, for them with this project. And we've had, um, honestly, quite a few people contact us. They're ready to move on and they're happy to get out of limbo. Uh, the other part of this, and, and somebody created a checklist, I didn't bring it with me, but all of the things that we really feel and were told that we needed to get done and accomplished in order to get the next piece going um, are, in a, are in a wonderful list, and all the boxes are checked except for the final one, and the final one is, is the North Dakota um, piece of it. We really, really need that funding piece, and I thank Governor Burgum uh, for, for putting us in his budget, but, but this is critical, and, and sometimes the, it, it kind of gets lost in, in, um, in all the details, but without having that legislative intent from the state of North Dakota's legislature, we, we are not able to, to do this in the most cost-effective manner. It's really, really critical that we get that, that, that intent up front. And um, when they only meet once every two years, now's the time to do it. We're going to be ready to roll here very, very shortly, and it's critical. So um, I, I'm just humbly asking the North Dakota legislature to please consider this project protecting 25% of the state's population. $20 billion and, and truly an economic engine for North Dakota. So with that. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, and um, we're going to adjourn. Gov, anything before we adjourn? Well, I just want to uh, thank uh, Chairwoman Sherling and uh, for, the, for, those, uh, for that appeal, because uh, certainly uh, having testified to the legislature on behalf of this project, I think the thing for, as any of you are interacting with Legislators, remember, this is a big number, uh, but and people get sort of, wow, it's a big number, but $20 billion of property is a big number. That's the denominator. The cost of the diversion, the state share is the numerator. The denominator is $20 billion. Uh, this will protect more property, more tax efficient than any before. They ask for the money is big number, 175,000 people, very big number, be the, the most people ever protected by a flood protection project. Uh, and then in terms of the amount of acres that are protected, uh, you know, big number on the ask, huge number of acres being protected uh, in terms of, you know, not just uh, Fargo, Moorhead, West Fargo, but also the rural Cass County that's being protected. And so I think there's actually more structures protected in rural Cass County as part of this project that there are in some of the other municipal flood projects the state has funded. And so this is, we can't get hung up on the numerator. We gotta look, we gotta be able to do enough math to do a numerator and denominator to look at that this is the most tax efficient in terms of per capita, in terms of property values, and in terms of acreage of any projects ever done at a lower percentage cost the state share. Again, I would say this is a bargain for the state of North Dakota. Thanks, Governor. Uh, thanks for your leadership. Uh, now, we need to adjourn, not just because uh, I think we've uh, wrapped up, but because we have a very important agreement that needs to be signed by you and Colonel Calkins. So are you ready? Well, before we do that, I need to call the official meeting to oh, order. Okay. Well, let's, we'll adjourn this roundtable, and yep. uh, I'll defer to you for your official meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. I will now call to order uh, the Diversion Board of Authority. A uh, special meeting, and I will need a roll call, please. Mrs. Sherling? Here. Mr. Peterson? I am here. Mr. Steen? Dr. Mahoney? 
I. Mr. Pepcorn. Here. Mr. Grinberg. Here. Mr. Judd. Present. Mr. Hendrickson. Here. Mr. Paulson. Here. Mr. Campbell. Here. Mr. Wayland. Here. Mr. Thorsted. Here. Mr. Olson. Here. Thank you. You have before you amendment number one to the Pro project partnership agreement between the Department of Army and the City of Fargo, North Dakota, the City of Moorhead, Minnesota, and the Metro Flood Diversion Authority. And at this time, I would entertain a motion to approve that amendment. Move to approve. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Sherling? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Dr. Mahoney? Yes. Mr. Pepcorn? Aye. Mr. Grinberg? Aye. Mr. Judd? Yes. Mr. Hendrickson? Yes. Mr. Paulson? Yes. Mr. Campbell? Yes. Mr. Wayland? Yes. Mr. Thorsted? Yes. Mr. Olson? Yes. I would accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any, anything else to discuss? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. And we are adjourned. Nice. If everyone would please go to the back here, or to the front, I should say, and uh, we will sign sign the documents and uh, have a photo op. Thank you. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks for your update. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, it was only We'll be up to see you in DC next week. Okay. Next Tuesday. It's being spent in uh, uh, Georgia and North Carolina and Puerto Rico, California, Alaska. Um, you know, this is the prevention that's going to save money. Lives, property, and money. Yes. Wouldn't you like the Senate to work while we work today? Yeah, absolutely. Like well, I, I think, I mean it, the, the, all the entities that you've coordinated here and the work you've done is remarkable. You notice all the chairs are the same size, so you can't look taller than this. But if you want, I kept trying to put mine yeah. up a little higher. I was trying to get. <laughs> you didn't drop mine down an inch or two, did you? Senator Mahoney's got your chair. I knew it. So, uh, flipping the page for you. You are fast. I knew it. Well, he's got that shining pen. <laughs> so. Harry, if you're right enough.
Yeah, yeah, that's our question. Yeah, I'm going to ask you how quick you're going to get to work. <laughs> <laughs> Come on.